Right, good evening everybody. Uh, and welcome to the second instalment of this Brick course. Uh, for those of you who were with us last week, uh, you will have heard Liz talking about her, her passion for fashion. Uh, and we are both de delighted and privileged to, to, to have Liz walking us through this course. Uh, and the second talk this evening is, is about Alexander McQueen, mm, uh, which we're, I'm sure we're all looking forward to, uh, to hearing about. Liz, can I just pray for oh, you yes, uh, before you start? Thank you, Thank you Father, for, for your promise that whenever two or three of us are gathered together in your name, that, that you're there also, and we welcome you through your spirit tonight. Uh, and we thank you for Liz uh, and for the passion that you've given her and the way that you've spoken to her through it. Uh, and we pray that you'd be with her tonight as she speaks to us and shares something of that with us. And so we commit this next hour or so to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Can you hear? Yeah, that's better. I'll try and speak a bit louder. Um, thank you so much for coming and getting from a bit wet to very, very wet to be here. That, it's really, really good. I love the British summer. It's wonderful, isn't it? It does get us wearing different clothes, though, doesn't it? So it's quite nice. So as Neil said, uh, last week we thought a bit about um, fashion, the things that are in our wardrobe, where they've come from, and, and things that we are um, sort of looking at today. This week we're going to think about Alexander McQueen and then next week we're going to go and think about sustainability and um, maybe a bit more about the present and, and the future, if that makes sense. So what we're thinking about um, this evening, as um, I said last week, when I did my second curacy, I um, did a, um, an MA and that's three, that was three years part-time study and in my third year that was my dissertation and I asked if I could do something on the work of Alexander McQueen um, and I my tutor didn't really know who Alexander McQueen was or anything like that so it was an interesting year for both of us I think but um, what I'm going to present is something of what I did in my dissertation not all of it um, why did I choose Alexander McQueen because of of all the designers I love his work. Um, so this is a McQueen dress. Like, who is that made for? I know it's stretchy, but who is that made for? But Mike bought that for me when I'd finished my dissertation. Um, Alexander McQueen, for me, cuts clothes unlike anyone else. And I've got some pictures as, as we're talking through and as we're looking at these things. Um, but what I thought I'd do is sort of give a bit of, um, or, um, of his life up to the point where he became a fashion designer because actually I think it's fascinating to hear about the person because then some of the things that I'm going to share for you visually, might, you just might go, okay, that was born in that part of his childhood. So forgive me, I want to get these facts right, so I'll be reading a bit more of the first bit, and then we'll go on to think about some of his collections, and then we'll, what, what I did in my dissertation with, with far longer time was to, to, what they call, reflect theologically on some of the themes that came from his work, and then thought, right, well, as, as theologians and as church, what does that mean? But if I'd have had extra words, I'd have liked to have said, but what does that mean for us now when we have people like him, I pray, coming along to our churches? But that's a whole other dissertation, I think. So anyway, he was, he was born, Lee Alexander McQueen, on the 17th of March, 1969. He was born in Lewisham, and he was the youngest of six children. And his, his very early years, so from babe to toddler to, to primary, were really nothing auspicious. So he was, I know we're not normal or typical, but generally his childhood was two parents who did love him, a, a dad who worked very hard. He um, went to school but didn't like it, apart from art lessons and he loved drawing. He loved, he was fascinated with nature. Um, he loved birds. He hung around on his um, local sort of, in the street, playing with friends. But it wasn't, it, it wasn't anything in some respects more memorable than that. 
Um, in a, a lot of work about his early years, what comes out is, first of all, that when um, the Queen was born, his father had some um, issues. I don't know whether they were mental or physical or, or all sorts of things, but he was taken from the family home for a period of time, but that seems to differ on what, what you read. So some, some say two weeks, some say three years. So, so that, that's an interesting thing. But what p is picked up is the, the really positive relationship that he has with his mum. He, he does sound a, a bit like um, a bit of a mummy's boy. But he, they spent a lot of time together. He liked some of the things that she liked. She was, his mum was fascinated by um, tracing the family tree back and ancestry and um, they have roots of family in Scotland and he was fascinated by history and finding out those things which you'll see in some of his works. What you will also find out about him is that um, his his childhood so from his early years to his teenage years um, were also tinged with um, difficulty in that his, one of his elder sisters um, was, a, was in a, an abusive relationship with her husband, um, a physically abusive relationship, um, and McQueen witnessed that because he used to go around to his sisters. So he witnessed that violence towards his sister. Um, but there are also allegations, and these didn't come out until he was about 40. There are also allegations that McQueen himself was actually sexually abused by this, uh, the husband of his sister. Um, and there are also some allegations about things at school as well. But again, it's all very mysterious. But what, what you build up as you read about him is a picture of, of a, a boy who was troubled, I suppose, and exposed to things that we might want to protect people from. Um, he was exposed to those things. However, he is um, in... I've just got a few books there, but if you read any books, the, some of the um, words used to describe his designs are, you know, outstanding. He was, um, I think, four times... Um, British Designer of the Year, and then he, was, he won the Council of Fashion Designers of America International Designer in 2003. So he holds a lot of awards, and he's seen as very prestigious. But what it seems to be is that he, it's an interesting life that he lived, because sometimes what you see is some of the things he says actually isn't backed up by what you might see in his experience. So he, he said, um, uh, you're, you're born a fashion designer, you don't learn it. But what you see in his life is that, so he left school um, and then he um, took, um, a, he went, because his mum suggested it, he um, went to serve an apprenticeship on Savile Row. So he started out on Savile Row. Sorry, that's a picture of him. Um, he started out with Anderson and Shepherd, um, and he um, started out as all apprentices do, making what they call a forward, which is um, a jacket for um, a client and this jacket would be made and you can see all the stitching and everything because what it was done was you made it so that you would try it on your client and then do the alterations before they get a bespoke jacket. Now normally this would take four to five years for an apprentice to learn how to make a forward. Four to five years. And McQueen did it in two. So all, everywhere he went, he was learning, learning, learning. And it was almost like an insatiable desire to want to learn more. So he was at um, Anderson and Shepherd for two years. And then he moved to Jeeves and Hawks. And he was there for a year. And as well as his work with, at Savile Row, he also worked with theatrical costumers. So again, that is brought back. So all the time he's learning, 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 
at Savile Row. And then when he's at home, he's um, reading. And um, one of the books, apparently, that he um, really loved reading was um, McDowell's Directory of the 20th Century Fashion, which is an A to Z guide of different fashion things. So he was reading those, looking at those, looking at those, making forwards or learning how to do that, cutting to an incredible um, level. Um, but he was also interested in the macabre. So he loved reading about Jack the Ripper and was really um, excited to find out that he could trace back some ancestral roots to Jack the Ripper. He loved reading about this person who, I, I don't know if I've got their name down here, but um, who was, um, had written something about someone finding the, the correct perfume and the way they found the perfume was slaughtering a virgin. Uh, and so, yeah, like all, I know, all of these like macabre things, uh, that coupled with um, what had happened to his sister and what's alleged to have happened to him, he, he built up this whole thing of, I think, using clothes as armour to protect. And um, you actually we'll get quotes in books saying that I want to protect women, I want people to be a bit scared of the woman that I dress. And it all is traced back to, I think, some roots that he has, his early, early years and his reading. Well, he, um, he, he, for a while after he's been on Savile Row, and these are only like brief time slots, and again, I think he's someone who seems to flip from one thing to another to another. So he was like two years at one Savile Row place, a year at another Savile Row place, and then he goes over to Milan, and he works with a designer called Koji Tassino, um, and he was only there for another year. So again, but learning, and this designer apparently said, um, clothes are not, this is me paraphrasing it, clothes are not designed to be put in a wardrobe, they're designed to be put on a human form. Because this is flat, whereas we bring clothes to life because we're not flat. And I think, again, McQueen brought that, some of that into his work because he always said clothes are to see, be seen in sort of the 360, they're to be seen in all the different dimensions and the silhouettes. And we'll come on to that in a moment. And then in um, 1990, he went over to Milan um, and he was there for an, until the summer. So he was there for only a few months. But all the time he was learning and all the time he was like absorbing all these things. So he came back from Milan to London. I don't know if you've heard of the label Red or Dead and John McCarrick, and he did some work with him. And through that relationship with John McCarrick, he learned about Central St. Martin's, a school for, for fashion. I think I've got a picture. I probably... Yeah, there we go. Um, and so um, McQueen went to Central St. Martin's and thought he would be um, employed by the college as a tutor. I mean, the bravado of the man is, is like nothing else. And so apparently Bobby Hilton was the woman who was um, the, in charge of, of the courses, particularly the MA course that he thought he was going to go in and tutor. And um, <clears throat> apparently as they met, he said, you know, I, I've come and, and I'm sure you'll be able to offer me a, a job. But something inside her was sort of piqued. And she went, well, no, you, there's no way that you're going to be able to, to be a tutor. And it's, again, it, in the um, notes about his life, apparently he was the same age as the students anyway, so why would they employ him? But there must have been something, because she said, come back, bring some of your work, bring some of your sketches, and I'll have a look at them. And she did, and he got offered a place on this MA course. So that seems to have made quite a significant um, difference in his life, really, getting this place at Central St. Martin's. Because what happens in this place was... Um, have I got a date? Well, that, was, that would have been probably September 1990. 
St. Martin's was known as a place to experiment. It was a place where um, designers went and they, again, from, this is all from what I've read, they seem to be a bit, if we're honest, loners going to this course. But what they found is that they thrived because they were all together loners. Does that make sense? So they all might have felt they were a bit on the edge of the normal places where they inhabited in school or work. But as they got to this course, oh, we're, we're sort of loners together. So there, there was a, an immediate connection and with the fashion. And what it seems to be is that St. Martin's was able to hold those people and they were actually able to, to work and to learn and, and to live alongside one another. But that that whole, that whole time of, of, of working and learning at St. Martin's was one where, again, you read of him working so hard at college and then you read of him partying crazily really hard at night. And he was like, he was inhabiting Soho, he was inhabiting the gay bars, he was inhabiting, you know, every single thing that it, had I ever known him, my mum would never have allowed me to go there, ever, ever, ever. To be quite honest, I'd have not understood anything of it. But, you know, he, he really did party hard. There was drugs, there was all sorts of things. But again, all the time, he was taking things in and there were influences from here and influences from there. Well, um, the MA course um, finished in March 1992 with a presentation of the third-year students of, of the work that they'd done. And I think they did a 10, yes, a 10-piece collection. And um, his collection was called Jack the Ripper Stalks His Victims, which is a <laughs> natty little title. And um, every... every um, garment that he made, instead of there being a label in, there would be a perspex bit of, well, per, no, not perspex, um, see, you know, fabric that you can see through, because perspex is hard, isn't it, sewn in, and it had a lock of his hair in it. Um, and, and this 10-piece collection included a black coat lined with human hair, and it was blood red on the inside. Um, a calico skirt covered in paper mache magazine articles and then burn marks all over it. Um, and, you know, all sorts of sort of craziness and things like that. But, you, but I mean, like, fashion students are notorious for things like that, aren't they? But I think one of the things that, that changed the trajectory of, of his then career was that um, a lady called Isabella Blow was there at the, um, the show and she worked then for Vogue. She saw his collection and she wanted it. And so again, it, it, there's, there's an anecdotal evidence of her phoning him time and time and time and time and time again, just saying, I want those clothes, I want those clothes, I want those clothes. And, and again, it's a bit disputed about how much she paid for it. She'll say she paid quite a lot for it. it McQueen will say, no, she didn't actually pay that much for it, but whatever the detail, she bought all of those, those clothes and then she did interviews for like Vogue magazine and other of the, the um, broadsheets wearing his clothes. And so his sort of name got really lifted up because Isabella Blow had the connections. She brought this new designer in who was, if I'm quite honest, you know, really different from a lot of the other designers and people were interested. I mean, he, I have to say, whatever his life was like, his clothes were incredible. So that's, that's a bit about him. Um, what I pulled out in my dissertation was a couple of things that we're going to look at. So one of the things that he um, had a fascination with is the whole area of beauty. Um, and yet, what he, what he sought to do, I think, was to um, push the boundary. 
And again, he's, um, he's quoted as saying, um, when people come out of my shows, I don't want them to, to say it's nice, like they've just been to a supermarket. I want them to either be sick or to rave about it. So he was, again, caught in controversy all the time. And so what he saw as the most beautiful silhouette is, is something like this, his infamous bumpster trousers. So for McQueen, that curve in the body was, the, was a really special thing. And so for him, these trousers <laughs> were, like, incredible. But review said, looks more like a builder's behind than a, than a model's. One of his shows is called um, Voss, V-O-S-S. And um, in that course, in, in that show, um, the fashion pack were gathered... The press were there, and um, actually they can't see what you can see. What they could see, so they were all around this place, what they could see was a box where the runway should have been, and it was mirrored. So what could they see? They could see themselves, or the person sitting next to you or behind you. The show was two hours late in starting. And, and we will never know whether that was planned or not. Because, again, commentators will say, what was McQueen saying by getting all these fashionistas concerned about looks, looking for two hours at a mirror? Who's watching me? Who am I watching? And all of these sorts of things. And then two hours later... Um, the lights come up, so w w and what is revealed is models. And you can't see really very well. Do come and have a look at these books. But m models in beautiful clothes, but the, um, they were wearing headwear and like um, almost jewellery that cut into their, their faces that looked grotesque. And it almost, again, it's like, are they in a lunatic asylum? Are they captured in this box? What is going on? Um, and, and again, just raising questions. What's beauty? What are we looking at? What are we consuming? And then the final... Um, again, apologies if, if you can't see that so well, but the final um, piece of his show was this box. I don't know if we can see it. Let's just see. Yeah, you can, you can just see in the middle there, there's a, the box, this is the finale, the box has opened. But this is a, a closer picture of it. This box is a box of a woman, a real flesh and blood woman. I think she was wearing a body stocking, at least I hope she was. It looks like she's naked. She's got a pig's head on her head and she's feeding through a tube. Uh, it's... it's um, a three-dimensional take on a photo of um, Joel Peter Watkins. He took a photo in 1983, I think. I'm not sure whether that's right. Anyway, um, and McQueen says, I wanted to end the show with that because I'm asking questions about beauty. What is beauty? What do we see beauty? Because beauty comes from within rather than the outside. So again, very controversial, but raising the question about what do we think beauty is. And so when we sort of think about that with um, our theological eyes, I wonder, I wonder where, where we go in some ways, because often we can be like um, the rest of society and be sucked into this thing that beauty is something that you see on the outside. And McQueen was pushing the envelope, was saying, well, is that all there is to beauty? Or is there something on the inside? Where does 
beauty come from? And there was um, a, an American theologian called Jonathan Edwards. In, he lived 1703 to 1758. And Jonathan Edwards was known for his sermons and his writings about um, beauty and aesthetics and ethical things. And for Edwards, and for a lot of, a lot of theologians, and for ourselves, I wonder, but Edwards particularly said that be- beauty is founded and starts in God. And it's only as we look at God, then we can have um, maybe a deeper understanding of what beauty is. Um, And Edward says that uh, the world, what we see in the world around us is God communicating um, beauty to us. So he, Edwards will talk about there being pattern um, and relationship in, in things of the world, if that makes sense. So like pattern in nature, pattern in the human body, pattern in relationships. But Edwards um, doesn't just narrowly define beauty as, as what we see, but he, might, he would say that um, people who work together in community, there's beauty there. Um, when um, people follow <clears throat> law, for want of a better word, <clears throat> and there's not not disagreement and falling out. That is a thing of beauty. Do you see what I mean? So he extended beauty far, far more. And so for Edwards, he says, without God, my understanding and appreciation of beauty is so much the less. Because in God, what I see is almost like pure beauty. And there's so much, and it's quite detailed, but Edwards did a lot of work and a lot of writing about that. And it's, it's incredible. And so one of the things that Edwards says is that when we think of beauty as well, we need to think about the context that it's set in. Because he says that sometimes things can appear beautiful, but if you look in the context, they're not. So he would, the wider context. So... Um, he didn't say this, but someone illustrated it by saying, so if you, if you see um, sometimes a villain, particularly in um, Shakespeare, sometimes we see a tenderness to that villain, don't we? Because they might care for one of their own in a, in a tender way. Does that make sense? But if we put that in the, big, in the wider scale of the play, they're not nice at all. But what we've seen in that microcosm there looks looks okay. But then when when you hear jazz music, if you take a few of those jazz notes out and just hear them without the other music, it can sound dreadful. But when you put it into the context of the other notes and the the environment, it's incredible. And so Ed, Edward says that when we see beauty, we need to be careful that we, we look at the big picture and that we don't just isolate things, but that we think, and he would, for him, he would say that the really big picture is God. I know that sounds a bit com- convoluted, but I just thought it was quite interesting, this person in, the, in 1705, considering things like that. But when I think of, of beauty, I mean, that there's so much that we, we could say. Um, and I want to, to press on because I think the whole thing of thinking about beauty is covered in the next thing that we might think of. And that's um, controversy. So there was another show that McQueen did, his, his 13th show. And actually it was called Number 13. And at the time he did the show, he had done some work with Dazed magazine. But we'll talk about the show first. So this lady who is the model is Amy Mullins. She's a Paralympian. And um, she has prosthetic legs. And McQueen um, had done this article in Dazed magazine called Disabled? Question mark. Because what he wanted to do was, again, raise the question of what is beautiful and what is ability or disability. So he got this um, lady, Amy Mullins, to model for him. And he had these prosthetic legs, they're elm wood, 
carved specifically for her. And um, people watching the show, including fashion editors, didn't realise that they were prosthetic legs. In fact, some of them contacted him and said, can we borrow those boots for a shoot? I think I've got a picture of um, Just see. Yes, there we go. I mean, they're exquisite. And, and in, so in that show, he raised that. And in this Dazed Magazine article, he was again saying, what is ability and what is disability? And do we do, we, do we do we do ourselves and our whole human race an injustice by saying, well, because you can't do that, you're a, a, less than. And I know we don't say that in so many words, but sometimes we do in the way as a society we behave and how we act and how we allow access for things. You know, you might have friends who uh, are, are wheelchair bound. Travelling is really hard on public transport but it, you know it's just saying thing, things what where are we and as a society what are we doing and, and maybe again as 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 church how do we enable people to feel part of the whole when I trained um, the one of the people in the year above me she was um, wheelchair bound and I have to be honest when I first went to college I thought oh I I don't know how to be around. Her name was Rachel. And it was because, I, because my experience was not of knowing someone who was wheelchair-bound, if that makes sense. But as we got to know her, and she was so brilliant as well, she spoke to us, she helped us, she helped us learn. You, you realise... This, this, they're no diff, you know, we're no different. We, we laugh, we cry, we love, we hurt, we we get angry, all of these things. It's just that sometimes physically their needs are different. And again, I think as a society, it's it's learning to embrace rather than to hold at arm's length. Um, And as church as well, maybe it's quite good to to be able to do that. Um, The really controversial um, show that he did was this. And it's called Highland Rape. And um, I won't keep those images up very long. Um, I mean, to be quite frank, the models did look like they'd been raped. And I rem- this is, I remember, I, can't, I don't know how old I was, I could work it out. Sorry, I haven't. I remember watching the nine o'clock news and Alexander McQueen being on the 9 o'clock news because of Highland Rape. So Highland Rape was one of the um, shows he did for British Fashion Week. Um, And it was the opening show of British Fashion Week. It was held in the Natural History Museum. And um, the runway was strewn with heather. And models came out in different um, states of dress, really. And some of the dresses were ripped... And some of the models were rather bearing more flesh than we might like to see. And there was absolute outcry. Um, Let me see if I can find a couple of quotes. Yes, it was critiqued as a horror show. There was outrage. Um, His bumpster trousers were there. And there were people just saying, you know, okay, this, this man might be a good designer, but you've We've not got to give oxygen to his designs. There was real outrage. McQueen holds that what he was doing was making a commentary on the clearances of Scotland and saying the land of Scotland was almost raped because of what happened. And maybe some of the uh, the women and the girls there were raped. In the, so the clearance is in the 19th century and he wanted, rather than portraying Scotland as a place where haggises run free and there's bagpipes and all sorts of things, he wanted to portray the harshness of the place. Now, 
I suppose in some ways we will never know, but it really did divide people. And um, maybe a question would be, did you have to do it that harsh? But, listen to this because this is really interesting. Some people said, that show made his name. And again, isn't it fascinating hearing something like that? So I have fast-forwarded through those because they're not particularly nice. I don't know whether they think this is nice either. This is another of his shows called Horn of Plenty. So another of his passions was the environment. And so Horn of Plenty was um, a show that he did really riling against consumer culture, which I find bizarre because... As a fashion designer, you, do, you are rather dependent on consumer culture, aren't you? Anyway, so the, the models wore um, these, uh, a lot of feathered stuff. It was a lot of black and white stuff, but had these really, really big lips. Um, and his runway... So on your left-hand side... Um, it, in the middle of the runway, so the runway, instead of being up and down, it would be like in the round, so they would walk around. And all of that stuff in the middle was like a rubbish dump. But all of it is um, pieces from his previous runway shows sprayed black. And again, his riling against consumer culture. And so what he did was he, he just put down the runway some really fascinating pieces almost like jarring with what you um, see in, in the rubbish heap and so some of these like some of the commentators will say some of these references from Christian Dior and Chanel from the, the hound's tooth but he was like just making a bit of a commentary so like on her head it looks like she's got a well, it looks like she's got rollers in. But if you look closely, they look like cans. So again, he's using rubbish to make headwear. And then this next one is, I don't know. So that is um, the white thing on her head that looks a bit like a nun's habit is a plastic bag. So again, he's, he's raising issues, courting controversy. I'm running out of time, so I just want to run. This, this was, um, I think, his collect, the final collection before his death, Plato's Atlantis. So here what he's doing is, again, it's another um, thing about the environment. And he's, his set is like um, thousands of years in the future when we're living underwater. And so as the models came down, oh, this was also one, the first fashion show that was live streamed. As the models were coming down, as the show went on, um, they started off with having like, the makeup small gills, but as they got big, as the show went on, it was like they had more gills on the side of their necks because we were becoming amphibious. And these boots, the armadillo boots, oh, I've got an... And can you see her hair? It's almost like fish-like. <laughs> and then, look at those. I'm just thinking it's amazing that none of them fell over. And those are called armadillo boots, and those are quite infamous as well for McQueen. So he, again, he was raising things um, like the environment. He was talking about the ice cap melting and just saying, do you know what? We've got to be careful with, with the... the what we're living in and we've got to be careful with our planet and so again all the time just raising issues but not subtly not subtly at all so when I came to, to think about this um, as we oh I just said that went in that's my favorite ever McQueen dress I love that dress. That's my indulgence tonight. If we're thinking about maybe some of the things that he has raised with beauty and bodies and controversy, 
One of the um, chapters I thought about in my dissertation is as people of faith, have we become maybe a bit too blasé about what we read in our Bible? So I don't know if you've read the book of Judges recently, but do you know what? There's some horrible stuff in there. That's all right. And and I th- and so not that I'm saying it's right for us to like put stuff in your face like McQueen d- did, but just raising some issues. So we we think of bodies of 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 being beautiful, but how do we care for our bodies and those of others around us? I'm just firing questions out to you, really. But I think one of the things for me that has really, I'm still grappling with it, is one of the fundamentals of our faith is is Jesus giving his life for us. And I think, and maybe it's just me, it's been sanitized. And in some way, I've lost the almost controversy of, of God on the cross. And not only that, but again, when we come and when we remember what Jesus has done, the, the bread, we remember his body broken for us and the wine, his blood shed for us, it, again, Forgive me, maybe it's just me, but how long does that stay with me, what Jesus has done for me? Or am I, if I'm honest, Sunday, I took communion and it's like, oh, right, it's the children's groups, right, I need to go and do this. And it's like, ah, oh, Lord, forgive me for becoming a bit blasé and not realising what you've done for me is actually incredible and one of maybe the most controversial things at all of all he rose from the dead and that I sometimes just allow that to wash over me maybe a bit too much and it's just coming to that place again and saying Lord actually what what my faith is is something controversial We thought last week, didn't we, about Paul writing, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the inner working of Jesus. And I wonder if we've lost something of seeking to live alongside people. And please hear me, that is completely right. But we've almost put ourselves into the mould of the world rather than saying, no, this is our faith. And yes, it is controversial, but it's controversial because at the heart of it, we have a saviour who died for us and who loves us and who is now alive. So what I tried to do was to look at those things and to say, McQueen, I might not have agreed sometimes with the way that he raised these issues, but he gives ground and things for us to to use to say how can we think about that in our Christian life and how can we use that when maybe we meet people who are like him to to meet them where they are but to say do you know what we have God who loves us and who walks alongside us and and let's discover more of that together when God created the world, oh, that was, we'll go on to that. When God created the world, we know that he looked and said, it is good. It is good. And it is good. And it's just maybe us, us re- rediscovering that. But also as he created, remember, he took the dust of the ground and humans were created. 
Again, not an, maybe an auspicious start to humans, but look, and we are the pinnacle of his creation. And so if we remember some of the, the things that we read in our Bible and are able to maybe expand and learn and, and journey together, then I believe we will be able to take the things that maybe have been intended to harm, I'm not saying that McQueen did do that, but could harm and, and enable them to be used for something that brings good. I will take some questions, but to, to say that these three books here, there's, there's a lot of pictures, and I'm aware that these were quite small. Do come and have a look at them. Um, and and this, this one here is not McQueen, but you might be aware that the, um, the Metropolitan Museum in New York has a Met Gala every year. So one year they, their theme was Heavenly Bodies, and the Vatican allowed some of um, the vestments from the Vatican collection um, to be in the museum, but they weren't to be in the same space geographically as anyone from the Met Gala. So these two books, so this book contains some of the Vatican vestments, and they are absolutely stunning. Do come and have a look. And then in this book is the more, I think they would say, um, secular, but they're still based on um, things to do um, from stained glass windows to things. But the work, have a look, it, it, they are outstanding. Um, so do have a look at those at the end. But if there are any questions, I will try and take those. Liz, thank you so much. That was fantastic. That was fascinating. Very thought-provoking. Uh, do we have any questions for Liz? I think because we're recording this, we're going to do it on the, on the microphone. So, Tom. Hi, Liz. Um, Hello. My, um, my daughter wants to go to Central Saints, and she's been encouraged to go there. And she's doing a, a, a Leeds Arts at the moment, and they're encouraged always to be... To be confrontational in their work and it has to be like that to be art that's that's more or less what they've been told and to be, go as far as you possibly can and uh, would you say that that is the role of an artist that's a really good question um, so let me share something with you um, which I hope will help in answering I think I think maybe sometimes it's this us settling and then the boundaries get moved and, and we find that a bit, bit um, I find that a bit uncomfortable. So when um, Mike and I, a, a long time ago, we went to, um, it, in the summer, we went to an event called Soul Survivor. And, um, and this is we're to a long time ago. And in, in the evening, so this, Soul Survivor then was for young people from... 13 to 18, that was, their, that was the primary group. There were people older, like us, and there were people slightly younger, but not much younger. But there were thousands of young people at this event. How, about how many? 5,000. Let's say 5,000 young people, all um, together in one place. And in the evenings, they would have a time of sung worship, and then they'd have um, a talk there is a point to this and, and, and this particular year there was somebody leading worship and this particular evening he was leading worship and his worship was like nothing I had ever experienced before in that one I didn't know any of the songs two none of the words seemed to come up anyway and three it didn't feel like it was a participatory worship time and so um, we went back to our tents and like I was like that's not worship, rah, 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 rah. And lots of other youth leaders going, that's not worship, rah, rah, rah. A lot of the young people were like there, like worshipping, dancing, uh, and like, but from that, questions were, well, what is worship? Well, why could, to me, and then, well, why, why couldn't I worship? Well, 
What do you think the person was doing? And all these sorts of things. And it was really, really uncomfortable. But what I learned was, what do I think worship is? Is it to satisfy my own? Oh, that was so amazing. Or is it something more than that? And so, in some respects, I believe there is, there is a place for boundaries to be pushed. My concern is... If, if our artists aren't held in relationship and love with other people, I think there are sometimes boundaries that it's like, no, please don't go beyond that boundary. So McQueen, as some of you may know, um, so his mother died, um, and on the eve of her funeral, he committed suicide. And I wonder if if there was a person for him for whom they could just say, come on. And so, so yes, for boundaries, but I wonder in the context of relationship where people are held. Um, so that we don't just do it for the sake of it. And I'm not saying that you're saying that either, but always, always held in that relationship of love. I guess for me it's really interesting in that with McQueen's shows, I don't know if he explained beforehand what he was trying to achieve or whether it was just a shock and then he explained it afterwards. But as Christians, generally we're taught to, you know, think on what is good and holy and pure and a lot of that for most people just isn't. So it's, but I think the challenge that comes out of it, like the thing about disabilities and creating something beautiful out mm. of something that's just practical, I think is amazing. So I think it's, yeah, it's, it's just, you know, it's thinking through things, um, and I think for me, it's like, with, what, what can we do with what's in the Bible in terms mm. of, mm. you know, he took lots of secular messages, but actually what then is the, you know, what's our response, I guess. Yeah. So. And you're absolutely right, Ruth. And seeing, and, and seeing I'm, I'm so sorry that I haven't got loads of pictures, but throughout, throughout the time, like, oh, actually I have got this. So if that isn't armour, what, you know, it, it is. Again, come and have a look at these pictures. So it's like she's wearing a dress over chain mail there. And I think you're, you're absolutely right, Ruth. I, you know, he, I don't know whether... Um, I, I could wholeheartedly go, yes, that was a really good idea, because I, I, I'm not so sure. He does raise the things looking at some of the stuff is not good to look at but I think what comes out is again those those things of, of his childhood and wanting to protect wanting to wanting to enable some people will say that he had a real down on women and I I think looking at him he's trying to protect them um, so um, that is a dress made from ra razor clamshells so again, like he, put, he does push the boundaries, but, I, but I, th I think God has made us creative enough to be able to use what is good to, to enable people to see that. And my prayer is that the things that are, are sown into our children and our teenagers, just like the things what it looked like when McQueen was squeezed, maybe it's not some of the nice stuff came out, but some of that good stuff will, will come, does, if that does that make sense. Any more questions? What's the relationship between the outlandish outfits that were in his shows and what would actually be sold to the public that's a, really a few good, months later? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. I, let me just see. So a lot, so a lot of his... Um, a lot of his garments, just bear with me, I'm just, I'll try and talk and do this at the same time. Yeah. Trousers round the, and showing the bottoms, uh, you know, probably about, ten, I mean, it doesn't happen now, but that, 
to me looked like almost a direct translation. Yeah. Um, and also, I think it's interesting in that obviously, you know, fashion through the years, women have shown the cleavage, and that's seen as okay. But yeah, so no, just interesting. <coughs> I, I, somewhere I've got, um, I, th I might have some. In the books, there are, that he has got some collections that would be far more what we would call ready to wear and things that you could go and have tea with your gran. <laughs> Me being a gran. Um, I don't know that I, I know you're seeing all my things on here. Um, let me just try this one. There are, there are some, um, there are some, I will completely come out of that. There are some that you see um, that are more ready to wear. But interestingly, um, and s some of his jackets would translate straight from the runway to everyday life. But those, like, women with the big lips and stuff, interestingly, I, I've come off there, but like the houndstooth thing, the dresses would translate really easily, but it's all the accessories and the makeup and the boots and stuff, not so much. Um, but I think designers sometimes do push the envelope far more. One, again, and he was very theatrical, and he wanted to create a spectacular and a show. But also, they don't want to be copied. And that's happening more and more now. You mean now after runway shows? What? You, although again, runway shows are, are changing because they're being streamed now as well. But what seems to be, it's almost like the show's finished, and this person down the road in their company has like knocked off um, the dress that you saw, look number two. They're selling it for fifteen ninety nine on ASOS or something like that because they've seen that but the more outrageous you do it the harder it is to quickly copy interestingly though um, Catherine married to William her, her wedding dress was from the house of Alexander McQueen so the, it's, the, it's all in the cut Any more questions? We've probably got time for one more, if there are any more. I'm an utter and complete novice on this, but did he do the printing as well? Did he design that print on that? Yes, yes. He did. So and does it look like um, an animal at the top and an animal in the middle? And, or is it just where no, I'm so sitting? The, well, no, come and have a look. But these are roses... But it, doesn't, it, oh, right. but it doesn't look like it, does it? No, it looks like a, an, an animal at the top with two eyes and then like a, a, a sheep in the middle almost. Yeah, so and then you, there's like an owl lower down. <laughs> is, that, is that wrong? No, it's not wrong. Oh, right. <laughs> but so if you have a look at this, so this is again what, a woman in the Atlantis. That's almost like a snake effect or a scaly fish if, effect. Yeah, he would have just that. Yes, yes. All, all of the, so again, he he was very, very hands-on as well. He would he he would have designed that. But that so he he would have designed that, and again, he worked on paper rather than computer. He didn't do a lot on the computer, but obviously that would have been that's that one is produced far more for the mass market, so that will have been. Um, it's not even woven in. It's printed on. Does that make sense? But come and have a look at these because you'll see them in a bit more detail. Brilliant. Liz, thank you so much uh, for that tonight. I, for one, have learnt a huge amount. Uh, and I'm sure everybody else has too. Uh, and it's just whetting our appetite for the third of this epic trilogy next, next week. Next week's going to be so about good. sustainability. Yes, in and duvets and all sorts of things like that. Yeah. yeah. So until then, can we show our appreciation for Liz in the usual way? Thank you so much.